Can everyone hear me? All right. Okay, um, my name's Sam Blaine. Um, I work at Catalyst IT on a good day. Um, and I'm here to just tell, give you a little bit of an intro to Linux containers. Um, now, I don't want to. I don't want to bash mini comps, but this is a mini comp, and it's it's not a. It's because it's not a professional uh, one. I, I didn't put as much time into this as my other regular talks, but I think it should be reasonably accurate. Um, now we we know we we know there are lots of different approaches to virtualization, starting from uh, complete completely emulating everything, uh, systems like VMware and QMU and uh, hypervisor-based solutions. Um, there are lighter, lighter ones that just try and uh, virtualize at the system core level, that's uh, what I'll be talking about today, um, all the way to application level virtualization, such as v, uh, web server vhosting. And these are always on a sca scale of continuum. Um, th th there's a scale between functionality and performance trade off. Um, I found this great map of Linux. Uh, and all the different parts of Linux and how they fit together. Um, it's quite a fun little map, um, just on Wikimedia Commons there. Um, if, you, if you're using something like QMU, you're, you're doing that, you're putting, uh, you're putting complete, uh, two complete kernels on top of your existing kernel and, um, and running applications inside those. Okay. With Zen and KVM, it's sort of somewhere in between. Uh, you, You've got a sort of hypervisor layer, um, s similar to a microkernel, and ver each of the different subsystems, which are these vertical columns, are isolated in different ways and have uh, different things bridging between them. Um, whereas with containers, it's at a slightly higher level. Uh, instead of instead of trying to provide a complete new kernel for the um, for the container, you're just isolating individual subsystems. At the closest to the closest to the user land, as is useful. So th these these cuts, the exact cut is kind of very broad. It, I, I had a look at the close detail, and it would get a bit jagged if I if I did it exactly. Um, so there there are a few there are a few terms. Um, there's the c the container, the the names namespaces and controllers. Um, so it's helped to know wh what they what these all are. Um, the container is the abstract entity. Uh, it's as far as I'm aware, it's no there's no actual co concrete object or configure option for a container. Um, so depending on what you do, you might just be do using it like BSD jail to um, to just stop a process from getting anywhere except where it needs to, or it might be a system that you've consolidated, something like that. Um, fundamentally, though, in the abstract sense, what it is is it's, is it's a bunch of namespaces that might have controllers attached to them. So, every yeah, the, the, way, the way it works is that every task has a has a bunch of pointers associated. Every every process um, points to all of the different subsystems that they're supposed to be using, like their, their current um, and th these are called namespaces. Like the current set of mounts, the current network stack, um, and so on. Uh, when when the user land do makes a system call, the operating system returns a customized result for that namespace. Uh, perhaps making their process ID private. Like if if it's in an init process, if in the outside can if on the outside system, it's got a process. I a process ID of you know 62, and inside the container though, it, it will, inside the PID namespace, it will get a process ID of one when it asks the operating system what its process ID is. Um, so th this um, during the during the early days, this guy Eric Biederman who did the most of the um, most of the pushing towards this this design, and it's it's quite a useful useful design. Um, so basically. There's a namespace for every, well, a whole, whole bunch of different parts of the system. File system namespaces have actually been around since 2.4.9, I think. Um, Cheroot's obviously BSD from um, 4.2, 1983 or so. 
and capabilities have been added to the kernel from about 2.2 on. Um, and each of, these, each of these systems is usable on its own um, and allows you to either uh, virtualize or isolate that particular system, part of the system. Um, a controller is the other, the other side of it. Uh, the controller is basically some kind of scheduler. Um, you have a lot of these in the network stack already with TC. Um, and there's one for the, there's one for the CPU, um, there's one for I.O., that sort of thing. Um, most, of the, most of that work came from IBM. Hmm. Yeah, other, other important terms, the con control groups is the classifying system for, um, for a container, effectively. And, and then the actual part of the code which does the scheduling is called the controller. So those are useful terms to, to, to know when you're looking through it. Um, yeah, so the, all of the main parts of the system have controllers for them. You can pretty much isolate, you know, you can tie a group of processes to a CPU. Now, the, the thing that I like about it is that you can get a, a system with, say, eight disks in it, um, and, you know, it's got, what, say, a six-core CPU and four network interfaces, and you can tie one network interface to each container, tie, um, limit the RAM and swap, to the quarter of the system for each for each container, um, tie and tie each one to their own disks, and effectively they're all running at full speed on on one piece of hardware, uh, but completely oblivious to each other. Um, this is quite different to vServer. It vServer just isolates. It doesn't really it doesn't doesn't really let you um, d d doesn't renumber things for you. Uh, it, it was built without. It, it was built with a single syscall called a vServer syscall, which turned into an IOC, which turned into a, a switch for a bunch of other syscalls. So, it's quite complicated. Whereas the containers is a, is a much smaller, um, much smaller interface, uh, but based on based around fork and clone. Um, and unlike vServer, you can actually have private tables in each in each vServer, which is kind of useful. Um, you can you can actually let your your v servers use things like mcnod which you can't do in v server and and there's a user ID, the, the user namespace um, in principle lets you um, deal with things like having file systems with with uh, users from different systems without having to extend the file system to say this is which v server that came from which is what you had to do with v server uh, So, yeah, th there's arguments to be made towards using light lightweight virtualization, but um, in a way it's kind of irrelevant because a lot of these features, because they've been added to Linux, that you can actually use a lot of these namespace features um, if you are using other systems, it's things like the IO, resort, IO um, scheduling and whatnot. Um, but there are benefits because if you, if effectively, if you can see through all of the systems name, all of the systems file systems, it can be a lot easier to manage. Um, can be if that's the way you like to work, but most mostly it's 100% speed because this is all s systems that the kernel will be using anyway. But one, what another particularly interesting feature I like about it is that um, because they've taken every identifier which given which is given to user space and allowed allowed two processes with the same that same unique identifier to exist on the same system through namespaces. It means that you can take the entire uh, you can take the entire set of processes, freeze them to an image, which you can then later restart, and you can even restart it on a different kernel version. Um, which means that it's possible Linux could someday have up times as long as VMS, which which, is ma which easily manages you know decade plus up times of a application up times because they can upgrade the system without stopping the application. Um, so if you if you want to know which one to use, I mean, of, often it comes down to more you know what's more convenient for you between these these two systems. But containers are slightly faster, and if you need any of those any of those things, then then y you can use containers instead of sin or vice versa. Um, mm, so this is really just a very high level very high level overview of what containers are. Um, 
best thing to do is just to just to give it a try. Um, it's certainly it's certainly early days. Um, for instance, um, if if in a container you you give it a TTY, which is the same as the one running on your X server, and you try and start a Getty on that TTY, it is actually the same device, so that won't do anything good to your X session. Um, and th there's other there's other little things, but it, it works on it, it works on the current Ubuntu, for instance, just out of the box, like app get install, and um, you know you can start your containers um, on that system with ease. So, um, does anyone want to ask anything? Yes. You mentioned that the uh, one of the differences with the uh, Linux V servers was that uh, you're able to do a make nod uh, to create dev null, for example. Yep. Um, but I, I believe you can do that with V servers with proper capability uh, for yeah, the guests. Yeah, there's, um, there's one switch that lets you make nod anything. Bring how so, that was, so you uh, can make nod dev kmm mm. and own the box. Right. So how does the Linux containers um, allow you to do that? They've got a dev whitelist. Uh, okay. Yep. So that I, I don't know what version that had, that was in. It's definitely in two six thirty three. Which go back one slide. <laughs> Anyone else? So Sam's allowed himself lots of time for questions. Uh, what well, one question? Uh, you mentioned there was no such thing as a container per se. Yep. The I.O. controlling, how, like, one of the things you might like to do, the bits that make up a container, they can be done separately? Like you can take just the I.O. bit or you have to go full hog? Sure, sure. You've got to, you've got to on, on the clone call where you create them, you've got to separately set the, the bits on the, on the unshare flag that says which, which things you want to make. It's one syscall still to create the bunch, bunch of them. And then inside it, you've got, got to do all your network set up and whatnot. Um, the the tools treat the tools give you an interface as if it's just one thing though. But there is there's actually um, uh, LX, there's an LXC command which will let you, I think it's LXC unshare, and that will let you just isolate one namespace at a time, um, which which is useful for experimentation or could, yeah, if you can find a good use for it, it's, yeah, it's useful. How stable is the um, code? Because the last time I tried it, which was only um, year pointing now, <laughs> um, how stable is the code? Because the last time I tried it on 9.10 Ubuntu, I set up a container and about two seconds later the machine went bang. Um, <laughs> whereas I've never had that happen with my mm -hmm. uh, V-Service stuff. Um, <laughs> you haven't? Nope. Wow. That's incredible. How long have you been using V-Server? Eight years. Eight years. Wow. Ah, uh, nice. That's that's a good. That's good. Yeah. So it's just, it's um. It's a good. It's a good system, Visa. Right. I I do I do use it, but I just I just um prefer something that's mainstream because th this way the tools will start supporting it, like top and things like that. Um, as far as I'm aware, the two six twenty seven on is about right, or two six twenty eight, something like that. Um, that's what's recommended in the in the install file for the LXC utils, and um, yeah, before then there were some issues, uh, some containing issues, that sort of thing. Um, but all of the code has gone through the, the rigorous Linux kernel peer review process. Yeah. Um, so in, in principle, it should be um, it should be quite stable. At least you can you can log a bug for it and expect not to get laughed at. Mm. Um, are there any restrictions on architectures on which uh, this can run? Like, is it on Intel only or AMD64, or are the less uh, common ones supported as well, like HP, Pyrisk, for instance? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Any operating system you like, as long as it's Linux. But it it will um, yeah run on all the platforms. It doesn't use hardware extensions. It doesn't need to, because there's still only one real kernel running. Um, and processes inside it that just see a different view of the world. So, um, so it, sh it should work on all those platforms fine. 
Hi there. Um, two kind of related mem memory related questions. Um, one is I've used Solaris containers in the past and the memory accounting isn't very accurate. It doesn't see um, shared segments within the container correctly, so you start running into the memory cap way before you should. So one question was, you know, whether mm. that's a problem. Well, actually, shared memory, shared memory is done quite a bit differently in, in containers. You, um, the shared memory is part of the IPC namespace. And so... Sorry, I, sorry. Oh, do you want, do you want unclear to on the terminal. I was being unclear with the terminology. I'm thinking about the kernel's ability to share data segments mm. within different processes. Yeah, um, I, I, don't, I don't know the fine details. But I, I assume what it's doing is, is using an RSS limit, so the amount of locked pages, or the amount of pages of memory that each a server can have before it starts swapping is limited. Um, it can do swap accounting as well. It, it is quite a hard thing to do, memory accounting, which is why if you do need hard memory limits, it's often just easiest to use, to use then, because um, it will give you a fixed limit on how much that server can use. Um, but if, if, you're, if the limiting works for you, it, it's, it, it means in, in general each system's got more memory available to it. And will it share pages if you've got two containers with identical versions of a binary installed? Will it share pages between those containers or do the name spaces prevent that? If they're the same file, they will. Okay. Like, um, y yeah, if, if, hmm, if, if an inode is the same, it's going to be the same page in the buffer cache as well. Um, and you can just have, you can have hard links between the different the different systems. Um, however, uh, that I, I actually I actually wrote that feature for vServer in about 2003. I haven't actually checked to see whether anyone's done that for the mainstream kernel yet, but it could be an interesting one to try doing. It's actually quite simple. It's, it's it was really bindingly simple to implement. The hardest part is stealing a bit, uh, stealing an attribute bit because those are quite precious, there's only a few of them. And yep. John, you mentioned being able to suspend processes and move them. Can you go into deeper tell us how that works a bit better? Okay. Uh, well, I only know, I only know the, abst the, the um, abstract d design for that from the, from the initial discussions. Um, if you want something exact about how it does it, you'll have to like look at the source and stuff. But um, so, because it's every single number that the kernel has given it about every network socket, file ID, file handle, um, user ID, that sort of thing, these can all be a, these are all abstracted from the real underlying system th through each namespace through, the, through all those different namespaces. So, when it's, it's got to take an image of all of the processes' memory segments and which how they've got their process, how they've got those segments mapped, that sort of thing. Save them all to save them all to disk, and then when it starts up again, it's got to reproduce that kernel state based on the numbers that were saved in the dump file. So, um, in LXC in LXC freeze, yeah, there's a program LXC freeze. You know, I think it's called that, something like that. It's it's pretty obvious when you install it which one it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also very interested because we've got crazy users who want to run um, compute jobs with run times of like six months. Um, how lightweight can you make a container and still be able to freeze a job? And still be able to freeze it. Well, one process. If you've just got one process, you can make a container for that single process yep, okay. and freeze it. Mm -hmm. Bring it back. Mm. This is, it's, it's really just, you, you set a few f extra flags on fork and it duplicates those kernel objects for you and returns. It takes no time at all, really. Yeah. Um, it's, you've been uh, involved in the Linux C server project for some time and I'm down here in the front. Oh, <laughs> right. uh, and it, the container project is strikes me a bit sort of like a suffering from a not invented here syndrome by the upstream vanilla kernel, uh, sort of rewrite of Linux v servers as as it were, uh, and we're kind of in a weird situation because containers are uh, in upstream vanilla kernel, but not particularly useful at the moment and have a lot to work out. 
uh, where the vServer stuff is not in the vanilla upstream kernel, but has worked through quite a number of these issues over the years. Right. And when, did you, when did you try it? Which which kernel version? I, I tried it last month. <laughs> last month, okay. 2.6.30, I guess. Yeah. Uh, okay. It's 30. it's just still quite rough around the edges. So I'm, I'm just curious about um, mm -hmm. why it is that you've uh, obviously, there's some uh, improvements with containers that uh, was on the fundamental level, but some of the benefits of well, this sort of virtualization are they, they effectively looked at, the They same. looked at all the design. Of, they looked at the, they looked at vServer and they looked at OpenVZ, mm. um, and they looked at Solaris <coughs> containers as well. And the IBM guys were bringing their stuff stuff to the table, and they were looking and saying, "Well, look, vServer, okay, it works, but it's it's not really." Got the legs. It's not got the. It's not got the the design to have the longer term features. I mean, it will. It is quite. Well, it should be quite easy to migrate from vServer to containers um, because they're, they're quite similarly designed. You just need to convert your config. Um, yeah, it seems like the containers still have maybe a couple of years out I, before they're I to know, the I mean, same I, I was state trying, of these servers. I was trying it again this morning on my laptop with standard Ubuntu, and I was. Mm. I was quite. A, I was actually quite happy with the way I could just, you know, create a container, de, just just debootstrap a directory, create mm -hmm. a container on it, start upping interfaces and doing tables and stuff like that. Um, yeah. I I'll have to try it again. I guess. I, I realise that there are some there are some traps. There are some traps. Devices inside the system are the same ones as the ones outside the system, unless they're virtual devices like DevPTS and stuff like that. So I don't know maybe it's because I was using a. Yeah, maybe 2.6.3.9 is was a bit ambitious, and you should be going for the, the latest stable one for that. So, a couple of questions. Where does OpenVZ fit into the scale of things? Okay, well, OpenVZ is a, is a vServer fork, and they they went down the path of abstracting everything very much like the current containers implementation is, or for, very much like namespaces. So, f right from the start with OpenVZ, you had um, Virtualized network stacks for each vServer, but the patch was very large, like approximately ten times the size of vServer, something like that. Last when I checked, um, and um, you know the, there was the, the things that OpenVZ people did, which I which I admire, was actually they they got involved with the with the containers project, and they started contributing patches, and um, so so they're. Um, if you like, they're, they're a vServer breakaway that started doing things their own way and then started working with the rest of the people pushing this pushing this code in. If you have a look at who submitted patches, there's quite a few contributors. Um, so you do yeah. um, I had a play, yeah, me. Hello. I had a play with the um, the kind of user space for this uh, maybe two weeks ago on, uh, I think it was a 2.6.31 kernel. And... Uh, yeah, One of the problems I had was, you know, you, you say you can restrict permissions to devices, um, but they are essentially the same device, and, and we had the same um, the same issue. The problem I had was the user space doesn't actually do any kind of sensible defaults. Um, have you found this problem? Like, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I see what you mean. There, but they, um, yeah. But then I, I tend to wrap the tools that I get anyway. So, you know, engineering. Um, <laughs> In, in engineering a, a different set of commands at that level was was um, yeah. I mean, you don't get like a build command. You don't have like build me a vServer and then start it. You've, you've kind of got to make a config file and then do the do bootstrap. Um, but I I don't actually see that as being a problem. More of a um, a room for some nice utilities to be written, or more likely contributing some. Contributing them to the Linux containers project, which is open source project. You know, so if, if you if you've got some ideas about the how the UI could be better, then surely just um, you know patches are probably welcome. Okay. Nice. If you enjoy me and thanking Sam. <laughs>